and welcome back to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. When we met last time, we completed our determination of the wave function for the particle in a box model, and we also determined the energy for that model system. We found out that the wave function is this, the square root of 2 over a times the sine of n pi x over a, where n is a positive integer and a is the length of the box. This is the first time we've seen the exact wave function of a system, and we've seen in previous videos that the first postulate of quantum mechanics tells us that the wave function contains all the information that it's possible to know for a system. So how do we actually use the wave function to get that information? Well, the fourth postulate tells us that if we want to know the property for a system, we get it using this equation where a hat is the operator for the property a that we're interested in. So, for example, suppose the property we're interested in is the position of the system. In that case, we'll plug the operator for the position into this equation. From postulate 2, we know that the operator for position in the x dimension is just multiplication by x. So, we'll plug that in for our operator, and the wave function psi we know for the particle in a box. So now we have an equation for the most likely position of our system. Let's go ahead and solve this equation. But before we do that, think about this system, the particle in a box, and what it's like. The system can move freely inside the box, and based on that, where do you suppose the most likely position of the system would be? You might want to pause the video for a minute and try to make your best guess before we solve the equation. A few minutes later. Okay, now that you've had a few minutes to think about it, let's solve the equation. First of all, we know that the wave function is zero when x is zero or less, and also when x is greater than a. So we only need to evaluate the integral between zero and a. Next, notice that the wave function has no imaginary numbers in it, so the complex conjugate is the same as the regular wave function. That means that the expression in the integral can be written 2 over a times x times the square of the sine of n pi x over a dx. a is a constant, so we can take 2 over a out of the integral, which leaves us with this. This integral has a known solution. It turns out that the integral of x times the square of sine kx is equal to x squared over 4 minus x over 4k times the sine of 2kx minus 1 over 8k squared times the cosine of 2kx. For our integral, k corresponds to n pi over a. So, solving that integral gives us x squared over 4 minus x over 4n pi over a times the sine of 2n pi x over a minus 1 over 8n squared pi squared over a squared times the cosine of n pi x over a. Let's plug in the upper and lower limits. The upper limit is a, which gives us this, and the lower limit is 0, which gives us this. But look at each of these terms. The sine of 2n pi is always equal to 0 if n is an integer, and the cosine of 2n pi is always equal to 1. That gives us this for the first three terms. Meanwhile, the sine of 0 is 0 and the cosine of 0 is 1, and that gives us this for the last three terms. So that shows that the expression in the square brackets is just equal to a squared over 4, and that means the expectation value of x is a over 2. Let's think about that result for a second. This is telling us that the most likely position of the system is at a over 2, which is the center of the box. That makes sense. Since the system can move freely inside the box, it makes sense that on average it would be located in the middle of the box. So our calculations have given us results that are perfectly sensible. 
let's try calculating another property of this system, the momentum. Once again, we use this general equation to determine the expectation value. Here again, when we do it, we'll get results that make a lot of sense. You might like to take a second to pause the video and see if you can think about it and predict what the average momentum of a system like this should be. A little longer than a few minutes later. Well, we have the same wave function as last time, so that's still what we'll use for psi. Postulate 2 tells us that the operator for momentum is negative ih bar times the derivative with respect to x of whatever comes after it. Just like last time, we can change the limits to 0 and a because those are the edges of the box. And once again, the complex conjugate of the wave function is the same as the actual wave function. However, this time we can't multiply the two wave functions together yet because the operator tells us that we first need to take the derivative of the second appearance of the wave function. However, we can still multiply all the constants together and take them out of the integral. The constants are the square root of 2 over a and negative i h bar, which gives us this. Now we'll take the derivative of the wave function. If you remember how to take derivatives from your calculus course, you might recall that this gives us n pi over a times cosine of n pi x over a. Since n pi over a is a constant, we'll take that out of the integral too which gives us this. The integral here has a known solution. The sine of kx times the cosine of kx is equal to 1 over 2k times the square of the sine of kx. Just like last time, k corresponds to n pi over a in our equation. So the solution to the integral is 1 over 2n pi over a times the square of sine n pi x over a. When we apply the upper and lower limits, here's what we get. But look at what we got here. The square of sine n pi is 0 when n is an integer, and so is the sine of 0. So the whole expression in the square brackets is just 0. That makes the expectation value of the momentum also 0. Does that result make sense? Well, remember that momentum is a vector quantity. It has both direction and magnitude. Our result tells us that overall, the average momentum is zero because there's just as much likelihood that the system will be moving to the right as that it will be moving to the left. Since these two momenta will be opposite in sign, the average will be zero, and so our result is very reasonable. Let's make our particle in a box model a little more realistic. So far, we've only been looking at a one-dimensional system, but of course, most real systems are going to be three-dimensional. Let's imagine a three-dimensional box. Just like the one-dimensional version, the potential energy is zero inside the box, so the system can move freely in the box. However, at the walls of the box, the potential energy becomes infinite, so the system can't move out of the box. Let's think about the Schrodinger equation for this system. You might remember that the Schrodinger equation for our one-dimensional system is this. And, since the potential energy inside the box is zero, we could drop out the second term, which gives us this. For our three-dimensional system, we have something fairly similar. The only difference is that we have three second derivative terms, one for each of the dimensions. Determining the energy and the wave function for this system goes just like it did for the one-dimensional case. Here's what we'll get. For the energy, we have the same group of constants, but this time they're multiplied by three different terms, one for each dimension. Notice that each of the dimensions can have a different value for n. We saw that back in video 6 when we looked at the two-dimensional system. Depending on the values of n, we'd have different numbers of nodes. 
For instance, here's a picture of a three-dimensional wave function with one node in each of the three dimensions, which divides the box into eight regions. Also, notice that the denominators in our energy expression have three different constants. That's because there's no reason that the box has to be the same length in each of the three dimensions. Next, let's look at the equation for the wave function for the three-dimensional system. Notice that this time there's three sine terms multiplied together, each of which corresponds to a different dimension with its own value for n and its own length for the box. Also, notice that the constant in front of the sine terms is just the square root of 2 over a times the square root of 2 over b times the square root of 2 over c. There's one more thing to notice about the energy of this three-dimensional system. Imagine we have a cubic box, so that all three sides of the box have the length a. Now, suppose that the three values of n are 2, 2, and 1. Notice that we'd get the same energy if the three n values were in a different order. So, for example, if they were 2, 1, and 2, or 1, 2, and 2, the calculated energy would be just the same. Since all three of these possibilities would give us the same energy, we say that this system has a degeneracy of 3. The degeneracy is just the number of ways of distributing energy levels in a system so that the total energy is equivalent. For example, suppose the three values of n were 2, 1, and 4 what would be the degeneracy of such a system? All we need to do is determine the number of ways we could arrange the three values of nx, ny, and nz. Here they are. As you can see, there are six different possibilities, so the system has a degeneracy of six. Finally, let's look at our one-dimensional particle in a box model one more time. Aside from extending it to three dimensions, as we just did, another way we could make it more realistic is by changing the walls from infinitely high to finite in height. This is much more like real life. For example, you might recall that one of the real-life systems that's like a particle in a box is a linear molecule with a conjugated double bond system. We saw in the previous video that the edges of the box correspond to the two carbons on either end of the chain. However, in reality, the potential barrier at either end of this molecule is high, but it isn't infinitely high. There's still a very small possibility that the localized electron can move beyond the carbons at the end. We can show that in our model by making the potential energy below x equals 0 and above x equals a finite. Instead of a particle in a box, this model is known as a particle in a well. This is a more realistic and practical model than you might think. For example, consider the example of a wire used to conduct electricity in an electronic device. You can think of this potential energy diagram as being like the cross-section of the wire. Electrons in the wire can flow fairly freely in the wire, but there's a potential barrier that prevents them from flowing out of the wire into the surrounding area. But that barrier isn't infinitely high. That means there's a possibility that the electrons can move beyond the surface of the wire. That's usually a very undesirable event. If the electrons leave the wire, they may move into another nearby wire, which would cause a short circuit. In order to prevent that, we need to make the potential barrier at the edges of the wire as high as possible, which we do by insulating the wire with a material that the electrons hopefully don't have enough energy to penetrate. Let's look at the wave function for the particle in a well model. Here's what it looks like. It looks fairly similar to the particle in a box between the walls, but it's much different at the walls and outside the walls. Because the barrier isn't infinitely high, there's guaranteed to be a small probability that the system can appear outside the well. So the wave function isn't zero outside the box, unlike the case for the 
particle in a box. This has some deep implications for electronics and also tells us some surprising things about the way electrons and other small systems behave. For one thing, the wave function never quite reaches zero outside the box. That means there's always a very small chance that the particle can spontaneously appear outside the box, even at very large distances away. It turns out that the amplitude of the wave function decreases rapidly outside the box, so the odds that the system will appear far away are extremely small, but they're not zero. This is true even if the energy of the system is quite low. And that's one thing that makes the predictions of quantum mechanics different from those of classical mechanics. Classical mechanics predicts that if the energy of the system is lower than the potential energy at the walls of the well, then the system will never be able to get over the barrier. But quantum mechanics tells us that because the wave function always extends beyond the barrier, there's always a small chance that the particle can get out, no matter how low its energy is. This effect is called quantum tunneling, because it's as though the system were tunneling through the potential barrier instead of going over it. Technically, this could happen even for very large systems. For example, perhaps all the atoms and molecules in your friend's wallet will spontaneously tunnel across three feet of space so that the wallet instantaneously disappears from their pocket and reappears in yours. But you know that things like that never really happen. Even though quantum mechanics makes it possible, there's two reasons why this is not really a likely result. First, as I said, the wave function of a system decreases very rapidly beyond the potential barrier in the particle in a well model. But more importantly, remember that, as with most quantum mechanical phenomena, the reason why tunneling can happen at all is because objects that we usually consider to be particles actually have wave-like characteristics. As we saw in video 2, though, the more massive a system is, the less it behaves like a wave. So systems like electrons, which have a very low mass, often exhibit behaviors like tunneling because they have wave-like properties. But once the mass increases, tunneling and other quantum phenomena are almost never observed. So even for systems with the mass of a water molecule, we never observe tunneling, even though it's technically possible. So such things are virtually impossible for something as heavy as your friend's wallet. Well, that's enough new material for now. By now, you're about ready for your first exam. I hope that goes well for you. When we meet again, we'll start talking about one of the most important applications of what we learned so far, spectroscopy. I hope you'll join me for that. But until then, have a good week.